Hi, I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains here at differentbrains.com. Today we have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Jenny Palmiotto. And she is out there in San Diego and she's a marriage counselor and family therapist. And she's got something special to talk to us about today. Welcome, Jen. How are you? Wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Now, I'm very excited about your upcoming event, Love and Autism. You want to tell us about that? Sure. It is a two-day event um, where we bring in the world's best uh, autism self-advocates, uh, researchers, professionals, um, parent mentors, and a, a number of people that check both boxes uh, to share their view on uh, love, intimacy, relationships, friendships, really the, the things that matter in life, um, relationships and um, the, the sense of belonging. We're going to come back to love and autism uh, because you've assembled a real all-star team, some of whom I know out there, and uh, it's going to be a great event. We're going to come back to that, but first let's backtrack and sure. introduce yourself. How would you get into all of this? What is it you do? How do people find you? What's going on out there in San Diego? So I'm the um, clinical director and CEO of the Family Guidance and Therapy Center of Southern California. And we are a, a small private practice um, that does relational work with um, under kind of an attachment framework, which means that we all agree that um, relationships are um, the most important thing in life. And uh, so we have a number of marital and family therapists, um, some BCBAs, and a number of other helping professionals. Um, and we all work together, and many of us uh, uh, support families and people, uh, autistic people. Now, you just said something that resonated with me, that in our crazy world I don't hear too often. It was just very matter-of-factly you stated, yeah, we kind of hang out with people who feel that the most important thing in life is our relationships. You want to expound on that a little bit? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. One thing that we all have in common as humans is that we are connected to somebody um, from birth. Um, we are connected to our mothers physically. And then throughout our lifespan, we are um, kind of hardwired to create meaningful connections um, from the parent-child relationship all the way um, to work relationships and, and friendships and um, intimate partnerships and relationships uh, are in our lives from the cradle to the grave. And yet in our lives, many of us, we don't put them first. We put other stuff first. I think that our fast paced world has us putting a lot of things first. And, and um, it's helpful to remember that um, when we allow ourselves to love fully and be vulnerable enough to kind of be our authentic selves with others, uh, that it only enriches our lives and creates the happiness and wellness that we often think will come with success. Um, but it can happen now in whatever um, state your life is in. Now, what drove you to uh, begin the Love and Autism Conference? What, what started you on that? So I have been in, uh, I, my first job and only job um, has been um, with people with autism. And so I started about 16 or so years ago. And, you know, then I was probably young and determined and uh, naive. And I thought that the autism community and industry would um, grow and change and, and become much more positive. And uh, I thought we would uh, do away with this concept of compliance being the goal of life um, years ago. And when I noticed that it wasn't happening uh, at the rate that I wanted to see change, I said, well, let me see if I can maybe put a small drop in the bucket of change. And I decided I would throw a conference that I personally had wanted to uh, see the speakers. Uh, so I just kind of arranged a lineup that I felt like um, stuck with my core values, that relationships are, are critical and that compliance is not, um, not as relevant within the autism world. What are the dates of the conference? Uh, our dates are October 8th and 9th. That's a Saturday and Sunday. Actually, our, uh, the next weekend. Now, you go where a lot of people dare not go. It's almost like a taboo 
to talk about with people on the spectrum, with Asperger's, with autism, their, any relationship at all, let alone you go into the intimate relationships, the meaningful relationships, the husband right. and wife, the boyfriend and girlfriend, the significant other. What, what led you there? Well, I think that when you understand relationships in their fullness, um, they're happening in every moment of our lives, and we kind of organize them in certain certain ways across the lifespan. And so when we decided to do love and autism, and the first concept was to do a 360 degree of, uh, of love, we, we decided to kind of hand pick uh, a number of different stories and ask each speaker to be raw, honest, and real. And talk about whatever it was that compelled them um, within within the the message of love, and that's how so many so many of the different um, uh, topics have come into love and autism. I don't um, necessarily tell any speaker what they should um, talk about. Uh, that's my only advice: is to be raw, honest, and real, and fit within our theme. And uh, these lovely people, these uh, amazing and talented people, have come up with these. Um, really compelling topics. What advice in general, if any, because I know every human being is different, and if you met one Aspie, you've met one Aspie. What advice would you have for the parents who sometimes feel no matter what move they make, it's the wrong move to try to be mm -hmm. helpful in that mm -hmm. regard? Yeah, you know, my, my advice is relatively simple in its... Um, in its statement, and it may be hard to live by, but I know what I notice about um, many people, including parents, is that um, we we put happiness uh, as contingent upon success. So I hear people saying things like, "If um, I'll be happy when my child talks, um, I'll be happy if I get 30 more minutes of speech uh, for my child a week, or when he gets into that great school." And happiness is available to us now. Um, and, and figuring out how to live uh, in a way that allows for happiness with whatever is occurring in your life, um, whether, um, whether your child isn't in the place that you wanted them to be in or, or, or whatever it is. And when people put happiness first and success at, um, as a secondary um, concept, success is available um, to them. And... And I find that it really strengthens families when they're able to show gratitude for where they're at right in this moment and um, to look around and realize that their life is very perfect. Jenny, that's very well said. And, and uh, I applaud you for uh, that uh, position. And it kind of goes in line with working with the positives and not the negatives, working with the strengths and not harping on the weaknesses. Now, I see you have as a speaker at Love and Autism in San Diego, uh, somebody we interviewed who I had a blast with interviewing him, and that's Michael Tolleson. You want to tell us a little what bit? What a doll. I just love that man. Uh, Michael joined, I met Michael last year at Love and Autism um, when he came down for the All Autistic Wedding, and he did this beautiful masterpiece that the bride and groom um, were married in front of. And uh, Michael took the microphone for about five minutes and had me in tears um, at minute one. And I, I since have, have had an opportunity to go to dinner with him a few times, and I just find his, um, his words of wisdom to be magical. Um, I think he's a really enlightened um, human being. Well, yeah, and he's champion of the underdog, too. And he's funny. He's funny. Yeah, he's got a lot of sides to him that are... Um, yeah, he's he's amazing, and I, I really think that he um, speaks to a, a, a really wide audience. Um, he's, you know, I think that so often in the autism community, um, people have a hard time listening to a self advocate because they have this checklist. Um, he doesn't look like my son because X, or my son was diagnosed at three and he was diagnosed at fifty, or there's all these comparisons, and and it seems that people. Um, might misunderstand that um, all those differences may not matter and that we can still learn from each other's narratives regardless of the similarities. Um, and, um, and, and the differences don't mean that 
uh, the advice or the messaging is um, somewhat not helpful to that family. So I think Michael is going to just dazzle our audience. I'm really happy to have him. He certainly dazzled me on our interview. And for our audience who might not be familiar with some of these names we're throwing around here, Michael Tolleson is an autistic savant artist. Another is Steve Silberman, who has the New York Times bestseller, Neurotribes. And you can, you can uh, see Steve, by the way, in his TED Talk. He has, does very good TED Talk, and you can find him online. He's all over the place, uh, everywhere. Um, I, too, love Neurotribes. I'm, I would call myself a super fan. I think it was um, just the right book at, at, at the right time. And um, I, I've read it over and over again. I, I Actually, the, the parts that compel me the most are... Um, kind of the where I entered the field and reading some of the reasons why um, why I might have believed certain things that I did and what influenced uh, my therapeutic practice at that point. That's great that you have such an all star all star team there. Uh, by the way, if you want to see uh, in addition to the interview at Different Brains with Michael Tolleson, if you Google him, you can see him paint a, an absolute detailed masterpiece of a painting in like about five minutes. He just does it. He does it. His brain just goes there. It's a pretty amazing. It's incredible. And he'll paint live at Love and Autism as well, which is just phenomenal to watch. Very cool. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about and by individuals who might have Asperger's or autism about intimate relationships? Well, I think one of the most damaging misconceptions is this um, belief that people on the spectrum don't want and need relationships and further that they don't have successful relationships. And so love and autism kind of hits on both of these things where um, there's nothing that tells me that people on the autism spectrum um, don't need to belong and don't need this sense of um, sense of, of feeling connected to others uh, at any stage of their lives, uh, and then the idea that these people don't have uh, loving relationships is just absolutely false. So um, we have a number of people um, that talk about their relationships, and in fact, this year um, David Finch, uh, um, author of the Journal of Best Practices, and his wife. Um, Kristen Finch are, are coming together to talk about their um, fun and healthy marriage, um, and they have a neurologically mixed relationship. And then we have a number of other speakers that um, will talk about their varying relationships, um, their friendships, and, and um, you know, committed relationships and such. So um, I think that the, the reason that that's damaging is that um, when we believe something like that, uh, it then allows us to ignore this primary need. Uh, it allows us um, as professionals to overlook um, and overlook and not discuss or have dialogue related to how do we help people that are underconnected or that are not having the quality of relationships that they want and need. Um, we don't attend to that clinically, and um, that's a mistake. Um, I think that when we um, make it a surface level thing and we just talk about social skills, um, we're, we're missing something. Um, most of uh, many, many people that I, I know that happen to be on the autism spectrum could write books about social skills. The rules are known um, for many. And uh, that isn't the same as having um, a sense of, of real belonging with another human being. And so our, our values as clinicians and our interventions um, as clinicians really, really um, shift if we don't believe that people on the autism spectrum want and need um, loving connections. And then another myth, um, and I won't go much into this one, is that people on the autism spectrum have sex and um, want to have sex and do have sex, and um, that's not talked about that much. And so we invite people that are, you know, open their lives up to combat that um, crazy uh, damaging misconception. What is there any general advice you would give to someone who is dating someone with autism or Asperger's or is married to them? And 
Well, I think uh, for me, the idea of authenticity comes up. Uh, and, and that for me is um, in a dating relationship, if um, either partner is not being their full and true self, it's not going to work. Um, and so uh, I think sometimes people on the spectrum feel like they have to mask and hide um, aspects of themselves. And I guess we all do that a little bit in the early stages of dating, certainly. Uh, but at, at that moment when you're deciding if this is a person that you want to date, 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 um, and develop a relationship with, um, both partners have to be their authentic selves. And um, if, if we're sending change messages to one another, uh, it's not going to last. All of the stuff you're talking about um, is just good, plain old advice for any of us. And I applaud that and uh, commend you on it. And I also, I want to salute you because you're going into areas where people are just chicken to go into. It's just hard. It's a hard thing. So, and we need well, it. Well, it's interesting because I didn't set out to be uh, in any sort of um, setting other than on a couch right next to somebody. The couch is right behind me, talking about their lives. And um, I, at some point, I just felt compelled to do a little bit more. Uh, and you know. While you're talking, I very much resonate with what you're saying. All of this stuff that we've been discussing are things that are just um, things of being human. Uh, and yet, I, I don't want anybody to assume that I'm, uh, you know, whitewashing the real, true, uh, disabling aspects of autism and the personalized symptomology for each individual. And I, I certainly um, under, understand that uh, many people are... Um, are contending with many things related to their diagnosis uh, and certainly want to provide all the supports possible um, that are dignified, respectful, and where people are shown real true loving kindness while receiving support. So um, I think sometimes, you know, whenever I'm talking, and I, I certainly am not on, on the autism spectrum, um, I, I need to always uh, examine my neuro major majority status here and and recognize that you know I'm constantly in a state of learning and I, I, I truly um, need and value um, the, the voices of uh, autistic people out there that are um, guiding my journey uh, and I, I can't wait to see where I am in five years and, and ten years um, because uh, we're all kind of learning and changing. Now for all of our audience who are going to want to get in touch with you and who are going to want to find out more about love and autism um, could you give us the information how to get a hold of you? Right. So you can find out anything you all about our event at loveandautism.com. Um, so it's and spelled out, uh, loveandautism.com. And uh, my website related to my clinical practice is the family guidance and therapy, or I'm sorry, family guidance and therapy.com. Well, Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here on this episode of Exploring Different Brains. I wish I could be there personally October 8th and 9th at your Love and Autism Conference in San Diego with all the all-stars you're going to be having there. Thank you so much for taking the time being with us. Thanks for looking out for all of us with different brains. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.com.